The first step that you need to take in causing a powerful physical revolution in your life is to have your priorities right. Now that might not seem too significant to some of you, but it's by far the most important factor. But you cannot really have your priorities right if you don't have the right motivation. So I'm going to be sharing about this in this section. But before I get into that, I want to share a few things with you that are quite inspiring. First, I need to mention that I attend meetings on Thursdays, and I've done so for some time, where we hear speakers locally and also many speakers from around the world. And they're really exceptional, their life stories. We're usually listening to their life story and the kind of ministry that they're involved in and what they're doing with their lives. And in one of these meetings recently, a book was presented that some of the people have read already, which was quite amazing on the life story of an individual. And so here is the book. It is titled, Come Along With Me by Norman Coop. I'm sure you can get it at Amazon. I will put it up on my website at helpsheal.com. There will be a book section up there eventually. And at the top it says the Harry Crawshaw Marathon of Life and it states Harry Crawshaw, Canada's oldest living legend at 93. This gentleman was 69 years old and in such terrible physical condition that he had a heart attack. But he decided to become proactive and I just want to read a little bit of what happened to him after he became proactive. He began to do running and to do workouts but he also began to take karate classes. So, I just want to turn to um, page 71 and read a little bit here. So, he's 69 years old and here he is, he's now 73. Within three years, at the age of 73, Harry achieved his black belt in karate. A third degree black belt at the time he was one level below the highest rank ever achieved by a Canadian citizen. And I read a little bit further down here. In March of 1974, he won the British Columbia Karate Championship. In that contest, he suffered two broken ribs and a broken finger. In May of the same year, the first Canadian Karate Championship was held in Monsanton, New Brunswick. Still bruised from the last competition, Harry headed east, hoping to land a berth on the four-man Olympic team for 1976. He was competing with men between the ages of 21 and 37. That is amazing. He also did some amazing long-distance runs. Now, I've only skimmed a little bit of the book, but the people that read the book, one of the gentlemen in the meeting shared that Harry Crawshaw did a long-distance run from Vancouver to Hope. That is 100 miles. He also did a marathon across Canada, and I believe it was both directions. So this is an amazing biography to read about. And it's not just that. During World War II, he was shot up. He parachuted and landed on a house, and then ended up falling off the house, landing among the enemy, and was all shot up. I don't remember all the details, but he managed to evade the enemy for weeks, I believe, and even had some gun battles with him. Eventually was captured after being hidden by people, had to go on his own again, wounded with these wounds, and was captured by the enemy. And then he escaped from the enemy. That's amazing what he went through, even in World War II. So this is an amazing gentleman to read about. I also recall that I had a book some years ago called Stopping the Clock by Ronald Klatz. And in this book, I do remember there is a whole list of anti-aging doctors and also people that were excelling in physical well-being into their 90s, doing amazing feats. And it was listing their lifestyle, what they take, the foods they eat, and the supplements they take. Quite interesting. I believe it was in the book Stopping the Clock. Pretty certain that's the one it was in. 
Now, having said that, I also want to mention that I did read, I believe, in this same book, Stopping the Clock by Ronald Klatz. I was looking for it all over here. I don't know what happened to that book. If I gave it away to friends or what. Or if it's just hidden somewhere. But I do believe it was in that book also that I read this statement. And that is that medical knowledge is increasing at a rate of 16 times greater every 10 years. Which, according to what I read, is greater than the computer explosion. Now, I want to qualify this by saying that I also have since read by the same author a more recent book that seems to have different statistics on this. And maybe not, because this is probably focusing on a different aspect of the rate at which computers are expanding in their speed in comparison to the rate of medical knowledge growing. In this, medical knowledge was growing at two times greater in this more recent book every three and a half years. So that means in 10.5 years it would be eight times greater. So I'm not sure why there's that difference. But I present these facts to you as at least they, I'm sure there's valid sources for them and that there's there's no doubt that there's a tremendous explosion in medical knowledge. Uh, the computers were increasing at a rate in their speed of two times greater every 18 months, which would be a year and a half. So that in a 10-year period, they'd be 128 times greater if they continued at that rate. Now, the reason I share this with you is because the fact that medical knowledge is increasing at that rate is very significant. The implications are very significant. There's a gentleman by the name of Ray Kurzweil. He is a genius, and he's a genius inventor and an expert in the medical field. He's someone that often has seen and probably still often sees Bill Gates. Now, if you go to the Life Extension magazine of December 2007, you will find a write-up on him in that magazine on the topic of immortality. You can read these magazines online at lifeextension.com. The only magazine you cannot read are the ones that are the most recent issue if you're not a member. Ray Kurzweil was speaking at a conference in 2007 and he basically said this. He said that if you can live in relatively good health for the next 15 years, that by that time, which would be around 2022, for every year that the average person would lose, they would gain more than a year. He was basically saying this that your life extension would continue and never end. In other words, you would be at a place where you could have physical immortality because of the amazing discoveries that would come into fruition and be able to be applied to people's lives. Discoveries such as stem cell technology, would, which would have developed by that time to the degree where whole organs could be re regrown or limbs could be regrown. Or there would be nanotechnology where little robots by that time would be able to go into cells and repair them. And of course, that's just a little bit. There's just so many discoveries that are happening now that, that they are finding out turn, that you can take that are natural products that turn on and off certain genes that increase your quality of life and expand your lifespan span significantly. And I will be talking about many of these breakthrough discoveries. Even in this month of February, what I read in the Life Extension magazine for February is incredible. There is a number of amazing discoveries I read about, which are natural products that you can now purchase through such places as lifeextension.com. Now, I don't personally put my trust 
in the fact that people will be able to achieve physical immortality. And I will explain more about that later in this video. Of course, there's also the fact that there's so many other factors, such as accident, possibilities of accidents, of war, of earthquakes, and so many other things. But this is certainly one thing that points out the possibilities. The fact of what I'm sharing with here, the possibility of this gentleman, because he became proactive, it means that your possibilities are also great. The possibility of all these new discoveries being applied to your life if you begin to become proactive now, means the possibilities of a far brighter future with many opportunities that would not otherwise be there if you declined mentally and declined physically or possibly died before that time. Now let's get into the right um, priorities and the right motivation. We see and observe in modern societies such as in North America and in Europe and so on, that many people get caught up in the stress of the so-called rat race. They're stressing their lives out with very little sleep. And why? Because they're being motivated to pay off a large mortgage. They wanted this really fancy, nice home. And now they're working long hours and getting little sleep and stressing themselves out and it's compromising their immune system. I notice that my little watch is going off here and repeating itself so I am going to just for a brief moment here turn that off. Sorry about this. Other people, they're wanting a really high prestigious position in the company and they're just slaving away again, stressing themselves out. Whatever the motivation is, other people, they just like to fly around the world. And there's others, they, they just waste a lot of their money on crazy things. This or that. And what happens? as they compromise their immune system. And the next thing you know, they need a drug for this. But that drug is compromising some other organ in their body or weakening the immune system or something else. And then they need a drug for something else because of that. And then this causes a cycle, an accelerating cycle. It's almost like there's a spider whip here and there and, ah, oh, I can, the doctor will take care of that's nothing. Doctor will keep, take care of that, so you dismiss that spider web and that spider web with a drug. But you don't see all these other little spider webs creeping up around you. And then you wonder how suddenly you can't get out. And you're trapped and these webs are getting stronger and stronger and you're a prisoner in your own body. And it was all because your priorities were wrong. You were motivated towards these things as if they were something that was of lasting value. But really they weren't. They were so temporal. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So, the fact that you were focusing on those things and making that the main focus of your life was a lie. Because you were believing and being motivated by something as if it was going to be bring you lasting fulfillment when it was just very temporal. There's another verse in the Bible that says, where your heart is, there is your treasure also. So if you put the identity of your whole being into things that are temporal, when those things crumble, what happens to you? You would end up crumbling with it. Is it any wonder that people end up committing suicide? 
Others end up flying off the handle and killing their whole family. We've seen so many tragic things. And then we hear statistics like the fact that people in their 30s are watching more violent video games than teenagers. This is terrible. People are taking into their being not only things that are temporal, but things that are destructive. That are creating an anti-existent anti state of being and causing torment in their lives. And then we wonder why people fly off the handle and commit terrible crimes of violence. All of these things are because we are buying in to a lie and putting the identity of the real essence of who we are in what we were not made for. So it's very obvious that it's important to have your physical priorities of well-being above any material or other temporal flirting pursuits. You know, a person could have bought a less expensive home that wasn't so fancy and looked so wonderful in the eyes of others or whatever their motive was. And they would have had a balanced life and been able to relax and to spend time doing workouts and doing all of these things. And as a result, they would be fine with their physical health and able to do learn a lot more and probably even improve their mental state significantly so that they could achieve a lot more in the long run. Far better than expensive hospital bills and your body racked with suffering, living and experiencing hell on earth and dying before your time. All because of buying into lying vanities. But there's something that's even more important than your physical well-being. You see, the very essence of who you are is not just physical. You have, you have consciousness. You have self-consciousness. You have consciousness that you are who you are and not someone else. You have the capacity to love because you have free will. That also means that you are self-originating. And that also means that you are self-responsible for your choices. So that we cannot really blame others for our choices. Nor can we blame God for creating the devil because every free will being that has the capacity to love is not a machine and is therefore the source of its own action and therefore self-responsible. There is something that is far more important than your physical well-being. The real core and essence of who you are cannot be satisfied by things that are merely temporal or that are lying vanities. It only can be satisfied by what is ultimately real. And let me define this a little bit. At one time recently, I looked up the definition of the word truth. And I found that the word truth, when you looked at a number of dictionaries, was basically defined as that which is real. So I looked up the word real, and I looked up the word reality, and found that basically what the word reality is, is that which is everlasting, that which is immovable, and never changes. So you might be asking yourself, what are you getting at? Are you religious or what? Well, let me tell you this. I am not religious. I believe in being a realist. I believe in being scientific. People that just believe things because they were brought up a certain way to believe things and have not questioned what they're believing as to whether it's reality are buying into lying vanities if what they're believing is indeed based on fantasy and fables. We need to be realists. We see so many people fighting over what they believe, but so many of the things that people believe are deceptions and rationalizations that have justified a life 
that makes them their own God or fills them with an ego, I was brought up this way and this is therefore what I am going to fight for and I'm going to sue. I won't have anything to do with anyone else or I will subject people unto what I believe or else. You know, whatever. But if it's not... I ask myself how people can believe things that are so obviously destructive and not constructive unto life. It's because they deceive themselves into being satisfied with putting their identity in their own ego, which may be related to who they identify with from their upbringing or the religion they were brought up in or whatever. But if we're realists, we will question all things with a desire for what is ultimately real. And if our motive is for what is ultimately real beyond our own reality, we will then have a genuine thirst for reality. And that genuine thirst for reality will lead us to what is ultimately real. What is ultimately true and lasting and fulfilling? And it's when you've found the treasure of your heart in what is unshakable, what is ultimately real, that only can satisfy the essence of who you are. And that means that when everything shakes around you, that is temporal, that what is unshakable will remain in you because you know that your conscience is aligned with what is genuine and real and on to ultimate meaning and purpose. And so I want to define a little bit more about what this is. Looking at it in a very objective and scientific way. First of all, I want to point out to you that I, I know this, that all the evidence points towards an ultimate reality. And it points towards the fact that that ultimate reality has to be of a quality that is ultimately trustworthy. And so I want to define this a bit more. We see the evidence in creation around us. For example, there's the first and second laws of thermodynamics, which are well-known, indisputable laws. The first law says that you cannot destroy matter. It just changes into a different form of energy. Basically, what that law is saying is that because you exist, something existed without a beginning. Then the second law says this that everything has a tendency to fall apart and be reduced to chaos over time. So when you put those two laws together, you have an amazing contradiction. Because those two laws put together would be saying this, that we should have been reduced to complete chaos in the infinite past. And yet here we are in a highly designed, complex universe where the brain, science has hardly begun to fathom, where they found with the electron microscope little machines, not little, amazing complex machines within cells doing work, within a single cell, that are more complex than the most complex machines we have, and more sophisticated. They are equivalent, according to an expert in this area, of a book I read, in Darwin's Black Box is the book, they are equivalent to creating a spaceship that can travel to other planets and duplicate itself and then go on and on traveling to other planets. That's just within the cell. This all points to an ultimate source of superintelligence and consciousness. There's other things that we see in creation that point towards this. We will notice that in everything in the created realm, there's a male and a female counterpart. So what is that speaking about? Well, we need to ask ourselves, what is that quality that could be ultimately trustworthy? It is a quality that can contain unlimited life and unlimited power without being corrupted by it. 
And the only quality that can contain that is an ultimate moral perfection. And the only thing that can be an ultimate moral perfection is ultimate perfect love. So what is this ultimate perfect love I'm talking about? It is a quality of being that is not only super intelligent, but is super intelligent in its very essence of choices because of this quality of love, which I will define. It is a quality that always chooses the highest good. It is a quality that is self-originating because, just like you, you were created in the image of this ultimate reality. So you're self-originating. You're not a machine. You have your own free will, which gives you the capacity to love. So this is a quality that always chooses the highest good for each individual as that pertains onto the highest good of the whole of creation, as that must also pertain onto the highest good, which is this quality, ultimate love, that I'm talking about. This ultimate reality is ultimate perfect love, and that is who God is. God is love. Now, I want to share a lot more about this towards the end of this series of videos which is mainly focused on causing a powerful physical revolution in your life. But it's obvious to me that it's very important for you to find your identity. In ultimate reality. So that you have the right motivations that will put everything rightly in perspective in your life. Because otherwise, things will be used as bait. You know, once I, I made up a poem and it goes like this. Don't take that bait. It leads to fate and everlasting hate. You won't be able to enter the heavenly gate. To it I will never mate. The fact is, things that are temporal are used as justifications for belief systems that are false. And I could go into that in depth, but this is not the place to do that. Whatever you ultimately trust in is where you are giving your worth and your glory to. So if you are trying to get rid of ego by doing some method of meditation or something, all you're doing is refining your ego beyond your ego. It's like trying to crucify yourself to a cross. There's always going to be one hand free. You will never be able to do it. You must trust in an ultimate reality that is beyond yourself. And that is only found in God, who is ultimate love. I will share more on, a, on this towards the end of this series of videos. I want to let you know that I have a website called ultimatemeaning.com. On this website I have written articles that are totally original with myself that answer the hardest questions, but you will also find that everything is backed up by many, many videos. For example, you will be able to see videos such as a professor that was an avid atheist that suddenly died and found himself in a realm that is far more real than the physical realm, as he described it, and found himself in a place of torment and hell that seemed like an eternity. But he ended up coming back to life. And he cried out to God, and I won't go into it all, but he now is totally converted. 
And he's not lying. He doesn't believe in lying as a Christian. He's aligned himself with what is ultimately real. Well, there's another there. And there are multitudes of these videos of an atheist. Again, this one, a professor of zoology or biology or whatever it was in a big university in South Africa. He was an avid proponent of evolution. But now he is exposing this masterful deception of lies claims to be so-called science. And so you can watch him speak for well over an hour. And there are many other scientists and many other areas confirming all the objective evidence for the subjective reality that one can enter into in a relationship with their Creator. And I want to explain that the evidence of the ultimate perfection of this love can only be in this. And let me explain a little bit more about this love. This love also has integrity. It will never condone the slightest thought, word, deed, or action that is contrary to ultimate perfect love. This is the protective aspect of the very being of God who is the very I am that I am, the source of reality. He's the very protective aspect of love known as His holiness. And that is always manifested in judgment against all that is contrary to love. That is why we read even in the Old Testament that when the children of Israel were at Mount Sinai and other places in the desert, that God warned them not to get too close or he would break out as fire and destroy them. Not because he hated them, but because he cannot condone what is contrary to his being. He is the very container. that holds the whole universe together. He is the very source of creation. And if he was to condone what is contrary to his ultimate perfect love, he would no longer be that. And therefore, he could never contain and hold this universe together. But he is ultimate perfect love. And that requires judgment. But the evidence of the perfection of this love can only be in this. And that is that this love is so perfect that God took judgment upon himself for you. And I just want to explain a little bit more about this. God, in government of all existence, is beyond the time and space realm, and is the originator of all things. And in that dimension of government, he is God the Father. Father speaks of being the originator. He also must govern within the time and space realm. So he expresses himself into the time and space realm. The word expression actually means son, and the word son basically means expression. So God expresses himself into the time and space realm. He cannot be a person beyond time and space and governance and not be a person in time and space and governance. To govern all things, he must also be a person in the time and space realm. And so his expression is into creation in his Son. And he humbled himself more than you, a mere creature, and suffered more than you, a mere creature, He took judgment upon himself for your rebellion, rebellious choices against his love. He revealed his love so that you could receive forgiveness. Christ shed his blood on the cross and died on the cross for your sins. 
so that you could receive his forgiveness and cleansing from sin and make and be reconciled to God and have his spirit come into you and fill up that vacuum in your being that cannot be filled with anything that satisfies in the core essence of your being other than his spirit for which you were created to have fellowship with. He suffered more than you, a mere creature. That is a love beyond your comprehension. How could anyone choose to refuse that for a lying vanity, for a belief system that makes the person their own God? And makes their reality the center over the ultimate reality that created them, which is God. Are you thirsty for reality? Or are you going to allow the deceptions of temporal vanities or of your own self-glory and self-righteousness to keep you from being broken from your pride? We must come to the place where we let go of our self-worshipping, self-grasping nature, which is a nature of pride that tries to ascend itself above the one who loved us so much. And that's why we need to come to the place where we humble ourselves and we cry out and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And when we truly believe like that, this is a belief that is not a belief of the mind. This is a belief of the heart. This is a belief where you're believing into something so that you make it the central treasure of your life. So that God becomes your motivation. Being married to your Creator. We see in male and female counterparts a reflection of this ultimate love, of this ultimate reality. There, there's female and male counterparts in all creation. And this is a picture of God's ultimate purpose because he wants a corporate bride from all backgrounds and peoples and nations and tongues to come together and receive him as their head in Jesus Christ and become his bride, which he's coming back to marry and to inhabit. It's like a bunch of stones described in the Bible being built together as a habitation for God or like a bride. Now, in the process of building a house, there's material that is wasted, there's sawdust. That represents those that of their own choice, of their own self-originating choice, choose to rebel against this love. That will not negate God's ultimate purpose. God did not decide to create us as machines. Or he wouldn't say, have said, well, we better not create beings that have the capacity to love because then some will end up in hell. Therefore, we better just have machines. No, God is not going to negate the ultimate purpose of his very being, which is love, because some choose to reject love. If they want to be the sawdust and not be part of this family in heaven, that is their choice. All the deceptive religious belief systems from atheism to whatever else it is are like a filtering system in your body. What's the filtering system in your body? It's your intestines. A large portion of the food we ate goes out as waste, but a small portion passes through the filtering system and becomes a lasting part of the body. Let's not allow ourselves to be caught in the filtering systems of this world of false unreal religions that obviously have their motivations in self-righteousness and self-worship and pride and identities that are not from the truth. Those that are thirsty for the truth will search things out and find out what is real. They will pass through the filter and they will have the thirst. You know, it says that they've hewn themselves out cisterns that can hold no water. This is a container that has cracks in it. 
So if we don't want reality, we're going to have maybe some temporal pleasures, but they're going to drain out and we're going to feel left destitute and empty and filled with torment for eternity. But the nature of God is like a glass that has no cracks in it. It is totally whole and can contain unlimited life and power. And Christ says this, whoever believes with their life into me, out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's the rivers of his spirit which you can experience of love and of peace and joy. So are you thirsty? If you're thirsty, there's another verse that says, Whoever is thirsty, come and drink freely of the water of life. So I'm just wanting to share with you this good news. That when you cry from the depths of your being, if you're not sure God is real, have him reveal himself to you. Who is the one true God? If you're believing in a false God, it claims to be the true God or whoever. He will reveal himself. And when you call out and you cry from the depths of your being and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my life and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Cleanse me from my sin, from all my sin, through your blood and forgive me for all my sin. He will come in. And you ask him to give you him, give his spirit to you, he will fill you with this living water. Now I could share for a lot longer, a lot more, but then you need to ask God out of a sincere heart to lead you to people who are true, truly those that have a relationship that's real with God. There are many people that call themselves Christians and do not have a real relationship with God. You want to be in a place where people are genuinely humble and real and also free, where there's a true reverence and fear of God. And ideally, the best place is in a church where the leadership allows each member in the church to share in the meetings freely as the Spirit of God gifts them, where there's a true love and a unity. And these congregations exist. Now, I would suggest this, that CBN.com would probably be able to tell you some good places where you could meet in your area if you're not sure, but I believe if you pray, God will lead you to people. Sovereignly lead you to people. So God's ultimate purpose is this bride. And it's to the degree that there is a measure of conformity to this ultimate love in the government systems of this world that we see greater prosperity and blessing in societies. But when they become selfish and unthankful, things evolve towards dictatorial systems that are oppressive. But God is bringing his government on the earth, which is his bride. And the more that bride is forming upon the earth here, corporately, in a genuine unity of love for one another and with God, the more the governments of this world will be shaken, for the Word of God says that all things will be shaken, that what is unshakable might remain. And that, the only thing that is unshakable, is this ultimate perfect love and the bride that is coming forth out of every background as history comes to consummation all of the other systems will be judged and shaken and undone by their own destructive ways and rebellions that are contrary to what is constructive and unto light which is only found in this quality which is ultimate perfect love Now you have the right perspective. And once you receive this, the right motivation, 
And it doesn't mean that once you've received God into your life in Jesus Christ that you're going to have an easy life. Not necessarily. But you're going to, in a sense, have a way easier life and a way more abundant life. Because now, it doesn't matter what contradictions you face, even if you are martyred. You know you're being martyred for what is ultimately real and ultimately true. So even, no matter what you face, there's resurrection on the other side. And because you have the very Spirit of God in you that raised Christ from the dead, He will take every contradiction if you trust Him through it and make an even more creative resurrection experience in your life through those trials. And if you come from a past that's so terrible that you can hardly accept God's love, and you feel like a cracked up vessel that is so empty inside, He's going to pour gold into those cracks and make something very creative out of your life and enlarging and fulfilling. He will make incredible beauty. The more the cracks are, the greater the beauty. So now, you don't have to have fear when you... It's the consciousness of being complete in God that negates uptightness or fear, which is the consciousness of loss. And you can grow into the identity of your reality in God. And yes, you will experience wanting, even after you've received Christ, to painfully die to things that you want to hold on to. But when you let go, they will be replaced with a far greater identity in your relationship with God. And in the end, God is so good that He often gives you the things that you couldn't have. Because now He can trust you with, you, with it because they won't become an idol in your life. Because He's become the treasure of your life. So let's make your destiny a destiny that is ultimately fulfilling, that can face anything fearlessly, knowing that you can find victory because you know your true life source. You've found your true life source. You've found a God that is genuine in love, a love that has integrity but is so great that He took judgment on Himself for you and suffered more than you, a mere creature, and humbled himself more than you, a mere creature. And you can get to know him intimately and personally. Thank you for listening to this video.